Hi friends! If you're new here, welcome! In this video, I am going to be making a comprehensive guide to sewing a basic 18th century men's shirt. Now, I made one of these a few months back for my menswear aligned 18th century pirate costume, which will be linked, uh, somewhere here, I think. But in that video, I didn't really go into detail and it was also my first time making one of these. I thought I would make a guide for you all because I have seen so many people struggle with this project. So in this video, I am going to go through how to create a pattern based off of your own measurements, including how big should your gussets be and what will different gusset sizes do to your final shirt. We're also going to go over thread pulling. Is it necessary? Is it not? Uh, as well as construction techniques by machine, by hand, and a combination. So there will be timestamps at the bottom of this video. If you would like to skip ahead, feel free to do so. We're gonna get started. So to talk about patterning, first we have to talk about the fit. So the historically accurate fit is to have a very, very drop shoulder, uh, like somewhere all the way around here, and then to have a very loose, long body of the shirt, somewhere around mid-thigh. Well, the one that I made previously is pretty close, I think, to historically accurate proportions. It's maybe a tiny bit big, but for the shirt that I'm making in this video, I'm going to be modernizing the fit slightly, so I'm bringing the drop shoulder up, and also the length I'm bringing up to a low hip length. I might actually create a graphic to help people with this patterning, but right now I'm just going to go over it. The first piece is going to be your big body piece, and this is one long rectangle that goes from the front over your shoulders and to the back. So the length of it is whatever over your shoulder to however long you want your shirt to be. The next thing is how wide is your rectangle? My opinion would be that you should go shoulder width plus 12 to 14 inches, 14 if you're on the bigger side and 12 if you're on the smaller side. We need to cut a slit T, a T-shaped slit in your shirt for your head to come through and also for the front slit. Right here, this T-shaped slit. It goes right smack in the middle of your fabric lengthwise because you want the front and back to be the same length. And then the width. The best way that I think to figure out how wide to cut your slit is actually to measure how dropped you want your shoulder. So I would go and see from the base of your neck how dropped you want your shoulder and then that's how far away from the edge you're going to cut your slit. So you're gonna take whatever this measurement is and go from one edge in, from the other edge in, and then the middle gets cut open. And then from the middle of that, you're going to cut another slit to make it the shape of a T. And how long should this slit be? Well, very long. Somewhere between 12 and 16 inches, I think is about historically accurate. You can change this to your liking. I'm going shorter for my modernized version just so that I can actually wear it as a shirt because you have to remember these historical shirts are actually not really meant to be a shirt. It's more of a piece of underwear, an undergarment. Like this would not be seen in any formal setting except for maybe like a little bit of the cuff and the collar. So you can choose to make your slit however long you want. Next, you need to figure out what you want your collar to look like. So your collar piece is going to be however wide you want your collar times two because it's folded in half plus two seam allowances. And then the length of your collar is going to be the base of your neck plus one or two inches. One inch if you want it to be relatively snug and two inches if you want it a little bit looser. Now this does include a little bit of overlap for being able to button the front closed. When I say measuring your your collar, I don't mean I don't mean up here, I mean down at the base of your neck. That is your collar rectangle. Now the sleeves. First we have to decide what you want the overall sleeve to look like, relatively how poofy and how big of a cuff. For your cuff, your cuff is going to be a rectangle and it's going to be as wide as you want it times two because it's folded in half plus two seam allowances. And then for the other dimension, we have however wide you want this, plus an inch of overlap, plus two seam allowances. You could also do three quarters of an inch of overlap, uh, depending on your button sizes, but something around it, three quarters of an inch to an inch is gonna be great. So then you have your drop shoulder, and how wide you make the entire body of the garment, I don't think super matters in comparison to how dropped you make the shoulder. Like I think you can just go shoulders plus 12 to 14 inches and then decide how dropped you want the shoulder. It'll just mean you have a slightly different amount of gathering in the front and the back here. But anyways, decide how dropped you want your shoulder and decide how big you want your cuff. So then you measure between those two points to find your sleeve length. And then you can add length to your sleeve to allow for a puff. The sleeves that I did 
are, the width is 20 inches. For reference, my bicep is around 11, 11 and a half. And then the length was 19 inches, which is three inches longer than the length that the actual sleeve took up. So this kind of sleeve puff is what it looks like when you have three extra inches of length in your sleeve. If you just have your sleeve as long as the length between when it's attached and when your cuff happens, you won't see a lot of puff because there'll be too much tension on the sleeve. Also, the width of your sleeve will help determine that. My sleeve width is about nine inches bigger than my bicep. The last rectangular piece is going to be your shoulder reinforcement pieces. They're just basically a strip that goes along the shoulder to reinforce it. Uh, and these can be anywhere from about two inches wide to like five inches wide and the length of your shoulder, that is honestly up to you. My personal recommendation is to go with something cutting it at like three inches or a little bit narrower. Uh, but you can also omit this step. It's just a reinforcement. But depending on how much you plan on washing and wearing your shirt and how delicate your fabric is, you may or may not need these reinforcement strips. So now, the part that everyone struggles with, the gussets. So, neck gussets. My opinion about neck gussets, and I found literally no information about this, so this is all what I think. Uh, maybe take it with a grain of salt, but given that no one else is talking about this, uh, I'm gonna talk about it. So, how big should your neck gussets be? I think that this depends on the actual shape of your neck and not so much to do with the size of your entire body. If you look at my neck here, you can see this muscle, my trap, sticking out a little bit. On my last shirt, I used two and a half inch neck gussets and that worked out pretty well for me. If this muscle didn't show as much, imagine if like, if I looked like this and it was more of a curve this way, I would go with a smaller neck gusset for that neck shape. I would go with more like a two inch or even like one and three quarter inch neck gusset uh, if it's very much like straight and then a little curve here. If you have huge traps and they're like this, I would go with like a three, three and a half inch, maybe even four inch if you have like giant bodybuilder traps. But basically I think however long this part of your shoulder to your neck is, is how big your neck gusset should be. Two and a half inches is from my collar line to the end of my trap. So hopefully that makes sense. Next we are going to move on to underarm gussets. These ones everyone struggles with. Not everyone, just like half of people. Oh, I also saw a huge range in underarm gusset sizes. I think I saw anywhere from three inches to like nine inches. And people also struggle with setting these in. I will talk about that later. How big should your underarm gusset be? This depends on the overall impression that you want your shirt to give. Your arm size, the space that your sleeve needs to be set into, is going to be the same pretty much regardless. So keeping that in mind, if you have a smaller underarm gusset, there's more space that needs to be taken up by your sleeve piece. If you have a larger underarm gusset from like here to there, then it is a smaller space for your sleeve to come in. The bigger your gusset is, the more gathering you're gonna have up here. The smaller your gusset is, the less gathering you're gonna have up here. So if you have this huge poofy sleeve and a tiny gusset, you can maybe do some gathering. If you have a huge poofy sleeve and a huge gusset, then you're gonna have a ton of gathering right here. Whereas if you have a relatively medium small sleeve poof and a small gusset, you're gonna have almost no gathering up here. Whatever look you want, hopefully that helps you figure it out. Again, gusset size range from what I saw is about three to nine inches. In my previous shirt, I went with six inch underarm gussets and I think that worked pretty well for me. So the last thing is that some people do a little reinforcement piece at the neck slit and some people do little reinforcement gussets at the sleeve slit and at the side of the body. I think those are all a little bit useless. The neck can be reinforced with a buttonhole stitch and with thread tacks, uh, and you could do the same on the, the sleeve and the side slits if you wanted. That is my personal opinion. <laughs> Moving on, thread pulling. What is it and do you need to do it? The shorter answer is if you want to. The long answer is depends those should probably be switched. So in my first shirt, I did thread pull, which is where you measure out the length that you need of fabric and then go to where you need to cut it, find a thread, pull on the thread, basically until it breaks, and then find it again and pull on it until it breaks. And what you do is you pull a single thread through the fabric, which gives you a perfectly straight on grain line to cut out your pieces. Is it necessary? I don't think so. 
depending on your fabric and how much it moves around, it might be helpful, but I have heard of a bunch of people having a lot of success working with linen, not thread pulling, so I think I think it's optional. That's That's my opinion. So for this shirt, I will not be thread pulling. I also can see an argument for doing some thread pulling, but not entirely thread pulling. On the last shirt I made, I did thread pull everything and every side on every piece. I think if you want to just thread pull one side so you, th you know that one side is on grain and then just measure to the other side, I think that also could be a great solution, but it is not strictly necessary. So to actually make this shirt, you can make it by hand entirely. You can also make it by machine entirely. Is that true? There might be a few places where hand sewing is helpful, but you can make it almost entirely by machine. You can also do kind of a half and half combination. So, let's talk about it. Step one, you're going to hem your T-shaped slit. Not the sides here, just the front. So how do you do that? You have a few options. You can hem it by hand with a very thin, like eighth of an inch hem, just finger pressing that, folding it twice, and doing a little tiny hemming stitch. You can also do this by machine with a straight stitch. Then you need to reinforce the bottom of the slit. Depending on your fabric, if you have a super strong fabric, you may not feel the need to do this, but I think generally it's a good thing to do. You can take a buttonhole stitch and go around the bottom part of that slit. And then you can also make a little bar across. You can make a bar with thread and then you can go over that bar with more buttonhole stitches. This is a pretty common reinforcement method that I've seen. So to add our neck gussets, we can start on this side. The finished neck gusset will be this square folded in half on the diagonal and stuck right into here. So I am going to do this combination by machine and by hand using uh, approximately a 3 8 inch seam allowance. I am going to put a pin in this corner where that seam allowance would be on both sides and then I'm also going to place it into this corner. Bringing this along here, I'm going to sew by machine from this point here, stopping uh, with this seam allowance left open. We're going to take this and we're going to rotate it, this edge, right sides together with this edge. Here, rotating it. I'm actually going to do a little snip halfway to this corner to help me maneuver this. And here you have the first side of your gusset sewn in. To do the other side, you're going to fold this over, fold these edges under, and tuck all of your seam allowances inside, and then you can either top stitch this down, or you can sew it by hand with a slip stitch or a whip stitch. You don't have to worry about these corners too much because this whole edge will be covered up by your collar being attached. Now, there's another method of inserting neck gussets if you're going to do this entirely by hand that I personally think is easier and less confusing than the backstitch or straight stitch method. And that is to take all of the edges of your gusset and press or finger press them under. And then instead of dealing with all of this right side, wrong side, flipping it around stuff, just take this piece and put it over the edge and sew all of the edges by hand from the outside with a felling stitch. Now we have to gather this neckline to fit onto the collar. So we're going to gather along this edge, along this edge, and along the back. To prepare the collar, I'm just going to fold this in half lengthwise and sew all the way down both short edges. Here I have my collar with the center and then quarter points marked, and then here on my shirt, the sides are pretty well marked because they are these gussets. I've kind of creased them in the middle, and then I've creased the center back, and now I am going to line up all of these points and gather between them to make the shirt fit onto the collar. To 
finish attaching your collar, you bring the rest of the collar around. You have all of your raw edges in here. Uh, fold this edge under and then to do it by machine you would pull this a little bit past the seam line and then you would stitch in the ditch from this side which means sew right in that crease where these two pieces of fabric attach catching this fabric so this has to be pulled past the seam line or you can just do this by hand with a slip stitch which is what I'm gonna do For the sleeves, we are going to start by putting the gussets onto the sleeves. So the first step is to take your sleeve piece and make sure that it's going lengthwise. Your arm goes this way and then you're going to take your gusset and you're going to line it up and you're going to sew along this edge which is parallel to where your arm goes. And I forgot to mention but on this edge you want to sew all the way from the edge, but on this side of the gusset you want to stop leaving your seam allowance right here. So now you have your gusset attached and you're going to take this side of the gusset, the one facing the end of your sleeve, and you're going to turn it this way and bring it to the other side. Now that your gusset is sewn in place, we're going to start here and finish the sleeve seam. And you want to remember that you need to leave some space open at the end to allow for your cuff. You should have a nicely sewn in underarm gusset. Your full sleeve should now look like this with a long rectangle and a triangle coming off for the underarm. To finish the edges, I am going to be felling these edges, and in order to also hem these edges, which you do need to do, I'm going to be felling the main length of this open so that it can just continue into these two separate hems at the bottom. This is the previous shirt I made, which was entirely by hand, and instead of felling these seams open, I decided to fell it to one side to add strength. To switch from going to one side to both sides for the slit, I have just kind of cut it and done it in a kind of quick and messy way and then tried to cover this with thread. You could also get a tiny piece of fabric and patch over this. I will say if you do want to finish these edges with either a serger or an overlocker or just by zigzag stitching the ends, you can do that before you construct it and then just have these two finished edges separately and then to hem the end you could just have it folded back once and then sew that with a straight stitch. So right here at the end of the gusset, if you're wondering what I'm doing for felling this, I actually took the, the corner right here and folded it under so that there is no raw edge there. So now that I've finished my seam finishes on this sleeve, I'm going to go ahead and start adding my cuff. So the cuff gets added in the same way as the collar. First we're going to fold it in half, sew the edges, uh, and then turn it right side out. We're gonna gather this, and then we're gonna sew the cuff on. So here is my cuff all nicely pressed. I am going to be gathering this by machine, which is not something I would normally do, but I'm in a rush for this project, so we're gonna try machine gathering. With machine gathers, one thing that I forgot doing a lot of hand gathering is that because of the nature of machine gathering, the fabric doesn't have this clear accordion path because rather than a running stitch, the sewing machine is doing a lock stitch. So this is one reason to do corded gathers, which are super great, but I didn't feel like doing them for this little piece of gathering. So instead, I'm just pulling these apart to hopefully get the gather folds as small as possible. By doing this, you can get a slightly closer look to hand gathering uh, because large, large and uneven gathering is kind of a dead giveaway for machine gathering. So if you're trying to get as close to a historical finished look while doing this by machine, I would highly suggest being really careful about your gathering because that's one of the big things that I think is a, is a giveaway. Not that there's anything wrong with making a clearly done by machine historical garment from before when sewing machines were really a thing. Everyone makes clothing that works for them and 
if doing everything by machine makes you happy and is within your capabilities, then absolutely go for it. I am now going to pin this onto my cuff and spread the gathers out as needed and then sew it right sides together to one side of the cuff. So you also have options with this cuff. You can either have it line up perfectly with your sleeve or you can have a little bit of hangover and then you can use this later when you uh, put your cuff on to underlap the other side, that way your slit is not overlapping. If you don't have this little overhang, then when you close your cuff, these, this part of the sleeve will overlap slightly, which is fine. I did that for my last shirt. I am going to go ahead and sew this by machine, being really careful to stay exactly on top of my gathering thread in an effort to keep my gathers as small and tidy as possible. As you can see here, my gathers are, they're not as tiny and perfect as they could be if I did them by hand, but they are relatively fine and small, so I'm pretty happy with that. As far as just whipping one of these shirts out, I think this is probably the most efficient way to get a pretty good looking shirt. To finish off the inside, or if it's the outside, that works too. Same thing as the collar, you're going to fold this edge under and either slip stitch this, or you can top stitch this by machine, or you can stitch in the ditch by pulling it a little bit past and then sewing in that crease where your seam line is. To attach your sleeves, and this is something that I struggled with and that I have seen a lot of people struggle with, and that is how big should your arm thigh be? How much should you gather that sleeve down to put it onto the body of your garment? If you do it too tight, you either won't be able to fit your arm through or it'll just be quite uncomfortable, which is how it was for me the first time I slept my, set my sleeve on. So my recommendation is to figure out your arm size. Take a measuring tape, go over the shoulder, and the first arm size size I went with was this. You can see how tight that is. This is 18 inches, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty small. Uh, so then what I ended up going with was closer to 24 inches, which is all the way down here. So you see how big that is. I would recommend taking a measuring tape, bringing it over the top of your shoulder, and bringing it down to like a good three or four inches below your actual armpit and making that the size of your arm size. This is when you need that arm size measurement. So correction, it should be more like four to five inches below your armpit, not three. Three, it'll probably be a little too tight. We're gonna take this, fold it back in half, you're gonna measure down from here half of that arm size measurement. And then you're going to mark that on your fabric on both sides. In order to attach the sleeve into that set amount of arm size space, we need to gather part of this down. So we're gonna run a gathering stitch only along the top portion of the sleeve, leaving out the gusset. And to attach the sleeve on, you could try to do a fringe seam. I don't really recommend it because I think it's very, very difficult to make the gathers look even like halfway decent uh, doing a French seam. So if you want to finish this entirely by machine, I would suggest instead to do more of a overlock or serge or zigzag uh, finish on the inside or to bind the edge in some kind of tape or binding. But otherwise, we are going to attach this now. So we're going to go right sides together, line this up from the mark, go around, meet the mark again. Here's the end and here is my side seam left open. So once you have your sleeve set in, now you need to close up your side seam. Fold your side seam, keep the sleeve inside the garment, and you're going to sew from, from this corner down the side. And then at the bottom, you can leave a slit around six inches, but that's a little bit up to you depending on the size of your shirt and how long it is. Uh, I'm going to leave a little bit of a shorter slit because I made my shirt shorter so I don't really need the slit for movement purposes. So after hand filling down these edges, as you can see I just folded the edge under there and filled it down and then all the way down the side seam and to the slit. For the top of the sleeve, where the gathering is, 
Mine looks like this, so it's quite messy. And what I've done on this side, or what I've started to do, is take a strip of fabric, fold all four of the edges under, and then pin it over this edge. So I'm gonna fill this down around all of the edges to cover up this messy raw edge. And then you can hem the bottom of your shirt. So now I'm doing the buttons and buttonholes. These two are on the cuff and I'm going to use these buttonholes and line them up with the cuff on the other side that I haven't done yet so that I can get the exact same buttonholes. So I'm just using these little wooden buttons. What I've seen in most existing 18th century men's shirts is thread buttons, which I have never done. To my understanding, they're basically a bunch of thread wrapped and wrapped and wrapped around something, and then that little thread donut, you then do a buttonhole stitch around that to secure it. I think there are a few different kinds of thread buttons. I'm definitely not an expert, so if you are interested in those, I would check out other people. But for my purposes, I'm just going to be using wooden buttons. But yeah, then you just do your buttons and buttonholes, which uh, you can do one or you can do more than one on the cuff, depending on how wide your cuff is. You can also do one or more than one on the collar. I actually didn't do any on the collar of my shirt because I planned on uh, not really wearing it closed ever, although I might change that and go back and add one on the collar if I want to use it for more full historical outfits. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this video was helpful uh, and helped you actually understand this project because I have seen so many beginners pick this project up as a first or one of their first historical projects and then get really, really discouraged. So hopefully, hopefully this cleared some things up. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I will see you guys next time.